to um, highlight this piece of information that's in the chapter um, because I like the graphic. I think it really uh, explains it very well. And it's something that um, can often explain differences in performance or differences in power production and things like that between individuals. Um, so the length of the sarcomere um, can directly impact how much force or tension can be produced. So we have this length tension relationship um, that's kind of the sum of all the passive and active elastic contraction components. So when you look at this uh, figure here, so we've got, um, here's optimal length of the muscle. And to the right is overstretched, right? So at this point, it's about 175% of optimal length. And you can see that the tension, the force production is basically zero. And that's because if you look at this diagram carefully, you can see, so they've flipped the colors around here, which is always a little confusing. I don't know why they suddenly turned the myosin red and the actin blue. <laughs> Counter to all the other diagrams in the chapter. Um, but if you look closely here, so here's the Z line, right? Here's my actin molecule, here's my myosin. There's basically no overlap here at all because the muscle is stretched out so long. And so at that point, if I can't make the cross bridge connection, then I'm not able to create power or strength or force production within that muscle. Right? So when, a, when the muscle is stretched a lot, then we see it's quite weak at that point. Right? To the left of the optimal length is what happens if it's understretched, right? And so here, again, we have a similar situation where we've got um, very little strength, very little force production, because at this point, the overlap between the actin and myosin is 100%. So there's nowhere else to go, it can't get any shorter than that. Right. So what's interesting is what's going on at optimal length. Right. So at optimal length, we've got the oh, oh, oh don't do that. We've got this really good overlap between the myosin heads and the actin protein with the receptor sites. So here we can generate the most amount of force because all the heads can connect to actin and shift it along. Right? So it's, really, it's interesting, each move that we do has this optimum period in there. Okay? So for example, when we do a bicep curl, right, the optimum is at the optimum length of the bicep is at on average it's at about a hundred degree of fraction right so that's the strongest point of the move when the bicep is stretched all the way out that's a very weak point of the move and when the bicep is totally squashed up Right? And as short as it can be, that's a very weak part of the move. So, 
oftentimes when you're in a gym, you'll watch people doing bicep curls or chin-ups and they cheat part of the move because they've got too much weight on the bar for the weaker part of the movement, right? So you'll see someone bounce the bar off their legs to get it to that 100 degrees where they're strong, right? And then they drop it and catch it and then let it go and bounce it because they've got so much weight on the bar, the only part of the move that can handle that weight is this little short range around 100 degrees. Same with chin-ups, right? You'll see people doing this, right? Instead of coming all the way down and coming all the way up, right? So there's pros and cons to that, I suppose. It makes that part of the movement um, as strong as possible because you've got the most amount of weight on the bar, but it's not strengthening the whole range of the motion. Right? It's stressing the other the extended end and the shortened end. Right? So you might want to do some very heavy sets with quite short movement but that doesn't mean that you should ignore dropping some of the weight off and doing the complete range of motion. Otherwise, this part and this part are going to stay weak. Does that make sense? And it's the same for squats. And this 100 degrees, right, is that's an average 100 degrees. But remember that everybody's bicep tendon inserts at a slightly different place on their forearm. Right? The tendons are shorter or longer, the muscles shorter or longer. Right? So that 100 degrees is an average. But we've got that idea in a lot of skills that we use in sport. Right? There's this very strong area of the whole pattern. And then we've got to decide, are we only going to train the strong part of the pattern, we're going to train the whole thing, right? My personal opinion is we should train the whole range of motion because in what sport, right, is that an action that we use, right? It's just not, right? We, we stretch our arm out, we bend our arm up, we've got to have strength throughout the whole range of the movement, in my opinion. Okay, so let's look at the adaptations because they're very interesting. So the first, we're going to look at aerobic training, so endurance training. What happens when we do a lot of endurance training? What happens in the muscles? Okay, so think about what we need to be good at endurance work. Okay, that's your starting point. Because, like a broken record, I'm going to say, adaptations are typically positive, right? So if I understand what I need to do endurance work, then the adaptations make sense because the body is just making those things more effective, right? So obviously, we've got to have good oxygen delivery to the muscle tissue, right? So what would improve oxygen delivery to the muscle tissue, okay? So it would be great if we had more blood vessels bringing more red blood cells and hemoglobin and oxygen. And that's what we see. Typically, much more in type 1 fibers than in type 2 fibers because if I'm doing endurance work, I'm training those type 1 fibers, mostly. Okay. We see an increase in the concentration of myoglobin, which is a transporter molecule within the muscle cell to move oxygen from the edge of the cell to the mitochondria. 
So that speeds up the oxygen delivery once it's in the cell over to the part of the cell that can do the work. Okay. Um, we see an increase in the size of the mitochondria. So it's like, imagine the mitochondria is a car plant, right? And the cars that are coming out are the ATP molecules. If I make the car plant larger, I can feed out more cars, more ATP molecules, right? So we, we see larger mitochondria and more mitochondria in the type 1 fibers of someone who's done a lot of endurance work. So that means that that muscle cell has a much increased level of aerobic metabolism and can produce a lot more ATP. And we also see an increase in the activity of the enzymes in Krebs cycle and in the electron transport chain. Right? So we want to increase the delivery of the oxygen and we want to increase our capacity to use the oxygen because there's no point in increasing the delivery of it if it's going to back up down the line because what's going on in the cell doesn't adapt as well. Right? Does that make sense? So then we also see changes in the fiber itself. So now, the oxygen only has to move that far from the edge of the cell to the mitochondria. So because the distance is shorter, that it can move across the cell more quickly, and it can get to the mitochondria more quickly, and so we can make ATP more quickly, right? So it's a pretty cool adaptation. Instead of getting bigger, the, the muscle cells decrease in diameter. The ratio 
of muscle cells doesn't change. So we don't see um, type 2 fibers becoming type 1 fibers, right? Because that's not, we can't change the ratio. Okay? But we can change how effective it is. Okay, so we don't get any type 2s turning into type 1s. We might see some type 2 Xs turning into type 2 As if they're recruited often enough in the training program. So remember the type 2 X are the ones that are the least able to do, um, to use oxygen to make ATP. So if I'm an endurance athlete, they're pretty useless really, except for a sprint into the line. And so if we plan the training program, then we can maybe see some type 2 Xs work a little bit more. It's not that they turn into a type 2A, but they start to work a little bit more like a type 2A to help with the aerobic metabolism. Any questions? I don't think so. No? Okay. So with resistance training, we see very different adaptations. Okay. Um, we're, we often see some hypertrophy depending upon the program and whether it's a female or a male, right? Um, men are going to see much more hypertrophy with a given program than women will because of their levels of testosterone, okay? And so when we um, are seeing the muscle get larger, it gets larger due to hypertrophy. So if you remember back to your motor behavior terminology, hypertrophy is an increase in the size of the cell. So the muscle fibers themselves get larger, right? So we see an increase in the diameter of the muscle cell with resistance training and a decrease of the diameter of the muscle cell with endurance training. Right. And that increase in size is... So, so what's happening if you like uh, do both like endurance and um, power? Okay, we'll get to that in just a minute, Neri. It's a great question. No, that's okay. That's okay. And I actually have some additional info on that if you want it. Um, so the, the hypertrophy is going to occur with the addition of actin and myosin proteins, right? And then they get larger. Okay. Now, in humans, it's not really, uh, it's, it's worth ignoring the idea of hyperplasia in adults at the moment. Um, so what they've done is they've done some uh, examples, some programs, training programs with cats. Um, and they teach the cat a weight training program. And so what they do is they put a cover on the food bowl and they link it up to uh, like a pulley system with some weights. And they teach the cat to lift the lid by pushing on the lever to get the food. Once it's learned to push on the lever to lift the lid to get the food, they start adding weight to the lid so the cat gets stronger, right? And what they've seen in the muscle tissue of cats is that 
the muscle size gets bigger not just with hypertrophy but also with hyperplasia. So they see extra muscle fibers, extra muscle cells. Um, so it's controversial in humans. It's not been resolved whether it really happens in humans. So most of the literature says growth in muscle size in humans is due to hypertrophy, right? Um, they have seen it a little bit in some uh, crazy high intensity resistance training type athletes like bodybuilders and powerlifters. Um, very small numbers of change. And so what they think is it's not that an additional fiber gets added, but a fiber that's in there might be splitting in two. However, the population that they think they might have seen it in in humans is also a population who are prone to abusing steroids and growth hormone. Right? So it's still not confirmed that, that hyperplasia occurs in a typically developing muscle when you train it. The fibers themselves will grow. I have a question before you move on. Sure. Um, so it doesn't confirm that it happens during like regular um, training effects, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But just what if go on. Like what is happening with people who are taking uh, like a steroids or stuff? Like is it just helps them to like recover faster so they can put more work on so they can basically work harder and then it happens? Um, okay, let me back up a little bit. So I think, yeah, people use steroids to stimulate muscle growth when they work really, really hard, right? So they're not growing big muscles and not putting in the work. They put in a lot of work. They just add extra testosterone or a, a synthesized testosterone. They'll often mix it with growth hormone um, to stimulate muscle tissue growth. Um, under that circumstance, with people who are doing very, very high intensity resistance work, they think they've seen this hyperplasia. But in a sensible human being <laughs> who's not taking steroids or growth hormone and is just doing their regular training, if their muscles are getting larger, then that's going to be hypertrophy. I understand. Right? So the steroid use stimulates protein synthesis. So the damage that you do in the training program mends a little bit quicker and then add some size on as well. Right? Okay, I understand. Does that make sense? So yeah, it helps a bit with recovery, but it drives this stimulus, like you would see in a, in a young boy who's going through puberty, right? As his body starts to release all this extra testosterone, we start to see muscle growth that we don't see in the girls who go through puberty because they don't release as much testosterone, they're releasing tons of estrogen. Does that answer the question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. All right. So then when we look at the fibers here, all the fibers can grow in response to resistance training. So we might see growth of type 1s as well as type 2s. If I'm doing a conventional type of resistance weight training program, then we typically will see more hypertrophy in the type 2 fibers than the type 1 fibers. 
and we'll see some type 2 X's behave like type 2 A's. We don't really see, again, we don't see a change from one muscle fiber to another. Ones don't turn into twos, they're all the other way around. Right? The mechanism for the growth in size seems to be a little bit different between the type 2 and the type 1. So the type 2 fibers, if you train them, will grow because they increase protein synthesis. Right? The type 1 fibers decrease protein degradation so they don't lose as much protein as the type 2s. But the type 2s are putting more protein back in than the type 1s are. You would use the type 2s, you know, if you're doing um, a heavy lift, you're going to use the type 2s more for power and for push and force. I remember that they can create a lot of force in a very short amount of time. Right? So a traditional type training program is going to work those type 2 fibers more than the type 1s. But we do see some change in type 1s as well. Now, to your question, Neri, what if we do both types of training together? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, the studies that the book talks about are mostly um, using people who are relatively untrained. Um, and so the conclusions might be slightly different if you have a very well-trained population. So I do have a research paper, I haven't actually ever read it all the way through, but last year when we were doing this, um, some of the students were asking, well what about if you have a, you know, a really well-trained athlete, what's happening? Because all this information is based on taking some low active or sedentary people and putting them into new training programs. So maybe the response is a bit different if we've got a, a well-trained athlete. What you want to consider when you're doing both types is you are asking the muscle fiber to try to adapt to two different stimuli. Right? So typically what the research says is that your strength and your power will be impacted if you do a lot of aerobic work. Right? And probably power is impacted more than strength. Okay. So that means that our anaerobic performances sprinting, jumping, throwing, could be um, lower if we do a lot of aerobic work at the same time. When you go the other way, your oxygen capacity, your endurance capacity, is not impacted by doing resistance work. So the endurance capability for that work isn't cut down, isn't decreased because I do some resistance training. So in your case, Neri, if the data on the trained athletes is similar to the data on the untrained people, then your resistance work would support your endurance work, not decrease it. It's the other way around that the problem occurs. If I'm an anaerobic athlete and I do a lot of aerobic work, then we see a drop in power. So that's like why a lot of um, coaches that are coaching sprinters will be very careful about the mileage, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they don't want to lose the speed. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because the more endurance work you do, 
the more type 1 fibers you're training and you're not training type 2 fibers and then, and then you've got this contradiction slower yeah 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 so for strength and power athletes the recommendation was that they should limit doing a, a lot of high intensity aerobic work um, so, you know, with your American football players, you don't want them to do no aerobic work because the game is three and a half hours long. But maybe you want them power walking or cycling or jogging. You don't want them doing a lot of, you know, five, ten miles. You want them doing lower mileage, as you said. Now, if the program's really well designed, perhaps it will take longer to see the adaptations in both types of activity. But as of the book publication, really you can't optimally do both types. Now, as I said, I do have this article. This article was a 2018. The effect of two different concurrent training programs on strength and power gains in highly trained individuals. So, if people would like that, I can put that up. But, I think that um, it, it does, it just seems like the strength and power gets impacted by doing the endurance, but the endurance doesn't get impacted to the same extent. But then I wonder whether that's, you know, is that because they're not doing a really heavy resistance program? Right? Kind of a different, a different question, I think. Like the, the anaerobic people might be trying to put in a lot of mileage because they want to slim down or whatever. But the aerobic people probably aren't trying to lift humongous weights. So, I'm not sure. But, yeah, it's really interesting that one way is affected and the other way isn't. <laughs> Okay, and that is the end of chapter five. Before I forget, um, there is some new material in chapter four, which I did not get to, um, because I realized that it was a little bit more information than I had planned for and it was going to take an extra class and I could not fit that in. So when you are working on reviewing chapter four, um, I would highly recommend reading this stuff because it's really cool. But the, from page 111 where it's talking about the effects of exercise on the brain, through to the chapter summary on 116. So that stuff will not be on the exam because I did not get a chance to, to go over any of that with you. But as I said, I would really read it because it's very cool. Okay. All right. So, what would you like to do Look at that. 
So do you want to try working in your groups? On the questions, do you want to take the questions and do it on your own? Do you want to review it? Do you want to try and use these breakout groups? Or do you want to just do them on your own? And then we'll come back and look at the... I think doing it on our own and then checking it together. Okay. All right, let me pull up the document. It's dying a death. Do you want to do one chapter and then look at the answers and then do the next chapter? Or do you want to spend time on both chapters and then we'll answer them? I don't really care personally. I don't know <laughs> what about others. Okay, let's do chapter four, and then I'll give you the answers, and then chapter five. So again, remember these are a selection of the review questions at the end of your chapter. I'm not saying that the rest of the questions are not beneficial. I've just picked ones that I thought would be um, would be useful for you to make sure that you understand that idea that we could cover in a short period of time in class. All right. So we've only got about 12 minutes or so.
you doing? Okay, let's look at chapter four. There wasn't enough time, I'm sure, for you to get through those, but let's have a look here. So, which part of the autonomic nervous system is responsible for speeding up the heart rate? and which part of it slows the heart rate back down to rest. system and then the rest and digest system. Which one is which? Is anybody still there? I'm still here. I think I'm good. Okay. Oh, that's bad. After all, we need to upload the tag. Say that again, sorry. When will you be uploading the exam as well as closing it? Uh, it will open at 6 a.m. on Wednesday and it will close at 11 p.m. on Wednesday. Okay. If that doesn't work for people, you need to let me know ahead of time so that I can make some other arrangements, but that's when it's scheduled on the syllabus. I'm happy to, you know, make other arrangements if, if that doesn't work for some reason, but you need to let me know ahead of time. Okay? No, yeah, that works good for me. Okay. Alright, well, sorry, I talked too much on the other slides because that stuff is so cool. So I think we're just about out of time here. Questions?
really recommend that you work through these questions on your own before you look at the answer sheet. Right? Because if you just go straight to the answer sheet, then you're not putting in the, the learning work, and that won't be as beneficial for you when it comes to the exam. Okay? So this um, review question paper is up and open. I will open up the answers to the review questions and the answers to the rest of the questions um, this afternoon during office hours. So you'll have everything there. Um, I have got office hours from 3.15 to 5.15. If you have, you know, if there's something that you would like to go over that you're not sure about, um, I don't technically have any office hours on Tuesday, but if you need to talk to me, email me and try to make an appointment. I don't think I have any other meetings tomorrow. So. Okay. All right, sounds good. Okay.